Hello, ladies. Welcome back to week two of Living by Faith, where we're continuing on in our study of Romans. And if I haven't met you, my name's Deb Matthewson. Well, even if I have met you, my name is still Deb Matthewson, apparently. And tonight I'm going to be picking up where Gwen left off last week in our study. And each week we like to have a main point to kind of get across with that. And last week, when Gwen shared with us in our our first week of this, she said that we all need Jesus. She is absolutely correct. And tonight, or today, if you're one of our Friday morning folks, there's nothing we must do. So that's going to be the main theme running through the couple chapters that we're going to be talking about in, in today's uh, session. So this is hopefully going to be some good news. So I'm picking up in chapter 3, of verse 21 of Romans. And in many ways, just like if you're with us for the last study in Corinthians, we talked about the fact that this is a letter that Paul had written to the churches. In fact, all of Paul's letters are intended for a church. And so this is to the church in Rome. And last week we, we learned from Gwen that we are all in need of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether we're Jew or Gentile. It, it doesn't matter how good we think we are. We all need Jesus. And in the first part of chapter three, we, we ended with last week, it kind of sounded a bit harsh, like we're all not, not so great as we think we are. Basically, verses 10 through 20 tell us that we're all pretty messed up. I know, newsflash, right? And then verse 21 starts out with a big old butt. And, and I'm, I mean a butt with, with one T, by the way. Just, you know, just to clarify. So funny enough, in my career as a learning consultant, we're taught that we should not use the word but because it's often a precursor to bad news. In other words, it can start out as good news and then the but kind of changes it to something else. Kind of like, um, oh, you got your hair cut, but did you mean for it to be that short? <laughs> your dress is such a beautiful color but isn't that, is that a great style for you, really, do you think? So sometimes the butt can take good news and turn it into something else. In Paul's case, it's actually the reverse, because last week we learned how we're all messed up, but tonight we're going to learn there is some good news, and he starts off with that. In fact, in verse 21, he says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law, has been made known. So there's hope for us yet, which is the basis for our theme that there's nothing we must do. And this also brings us to our first fill-in for this session. And that fill-in is, it's only God's grace that justifies us, not anything we can do. And I'll leave that up for a moment. For any that are filling those in and your in your handout, you notice there's a picture there of a of a courtroom. Can you imagine having to stand before God in a courtroom and justify all of our actions to make a case for why God should forgive us? Oh my gosh! Can you imagine how long that would take if I had to go back and think of oh gosh, what what did I do yesterday? I have trouble remembering what I did yesterday. Much less going back to, you know, years and years. And thankfully, I don't have to do that because in 24, in verse 24 of chapter three, I've got my handy dandy, uh, big old Bible here. In verse 24, he says, and I'll, I'll do the lead in on 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we are all eligible for this. We don't have to stand in a courtroom. Now, on the one hand, that should seem kind of freeing, like, oh, I don't have to do anything. It can also be difficult for some of us, maybe for many of us, because there, that takes away any control that we have. I think a lot of us like to feel that we have some, some control over uh, what's going on. And I think sometimes if there's a comfort in knowing, oh, if I follow X, Y, and Z, then this will happen. 
and we want to, I know I'm a checklist person. I want to be checking stuff off. I want to, if I do this, 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 then my day will go well. Things don't always work uh, the way that you think. In fact, I discovered that this weekend. So some of the more, for me at least, some of the silver linings to this isolation. And I, I know Doyle in his message this weekend talked about being an introvert. I am too. So in some ways it's kind of an introvert's dream in a way to be, you know, locked in my house kind of by myself with just my dog. But some other positives are that I finally got a chance to paint an office that has been in dire need of it. In fact, I'm, I'm in it right now. And so I had this whole plan of uh, painting and I took Friday off work. And uh, by, by the way, as I'm recording this, it's Sunday. I took Friday off work and I thought, I'm gonna get this done, I'm gonna get this done. And then by Saturday, everything's gonna be put together. I'm gonna be ready to go. And then I'll have all day Sunday to you know relax. Yeah, that didn't happen because paint didn't cover like it should or I forgot that I'm not as good at painting as I remember and there were some drips going on there. But finally got it worked out. But I had to let go of, it's gotta happen by this time because it, it just doesn't always happen. Another silver lining is that I am an avid TV binge watcher. Now, maybe this is good news and maybe it's not. I, I think so. But I recently discovered, well, I didn't discover it. I saw some friends on Facebook talking about a show called Stiesel. And I am fascinated. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. And it's um, S H. T-I-S-E-L, Stiesel. That's the last name of a family. And, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a show about an Orthodox Jewish family living in Jerusalem. And it's a scripted drama. It's, it's not like a documentary. It's fascinating to me. I'm loving the characters and I am loving seeing how they have so many rituals and, and some that I knew about and, and some that I didn't. Uh, some of the things that I've seen, like just in the way they dress, how they're always, uh, you know, certain cleansing rituals they have. When I've noticed whenever they walk into somebody's house, they always kiss their hand and kiss like the threshold as they walk in before they take a first sip of a, of a glass of water. They have like a certain blessing that they say before they drink it. Same thing with food. So there are a lot of, of rituals and things that they are following in their law. And have, I've, I've not been raised Jewish. Maybe some of you are. If not, and if you're like me, a Gentile, we might think, oh gosh, how sad they have all those rituals. We don't really have that, you know, as Christians. But you know, we kind of do. We kind of do have our rituals, even though we may not always realize it. And there are things that we want to do to make sure that we're, we're measuring up. And sometimes we don't even realize we're doing that. So while the grace that God extends through Christ should be a freeing thing, it can also mean that we have to give up some control that we have anything to do with our salvation, that there aren't certain steps. And so it should be good news for us. And it should have been good news for this church in Rome, who, by the way, was made up of Gentiles and Jews who are now all believers in Christ. And they're having to, to kind of co-mingle. I think for those of you that were with us in the last study, we, we saw that in the Church of Corinth as well. They had things that they had to work out um, as, as new believers. One of the interesting things is that in leading up to this point, often we would see, especially in Jesus' time, the Jews being the ones that were looking down on everyone else because they're God's chosen people. And not that all of the Jews at this time were like that, but many of them were, and they often thought, well, you have to follow our law. You need to do this, 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 even though they were now Christians, where the Gentiles were, were thinking, what? I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about right now, because I never did anything like that. Well, now we have kind of a reversal of that, and we always like to think of the Jews as being the ones that were talking down to everybody else, but it was now happening with the Gentiles, and part of it was that prior to this letter, there was a decree by the Roman Emperor Claudius that said that all Jews had to leave Rome. So they were expelled from Rome. And eventually that decree lapsed and the Jews were allowed to come back. Well, while they were gone, these Christian churches made up obviously of Gentiles, since the Jews weren't there, were now flourishing and they were all together and, and kind of a cohesive group, I suppose. And now the Jews are coming back and now they're kind of the minority. And now it's the Gentiles that are kind of looking down on them 
as if to say, oh, look at you, you're having to follow that law. We're more enlightened than that. We don't need, we don't need that law. You don't have to follow that law anymore, which to a degree might have been true, but this was hard. So they have this issue probably on both sides where Gentiles were thinking that the Jews weren't right because they were still following the law. And Jews might've been thinking that the Gentiles weren't right because they weren't following the law. And really neither side had a leg to stand on if they thought they were better because God's saying, no, my grace, I took care of this, nothing that you did. And so in light of that, we bring our next uh, application point, which is God's grace toward us should cause us to have more grace toward each other. The fact that we have been saved through nothing we have done should make us extend more grace to other people and realize I'm no better than they are. So I have no place talking down about them because maybe they do things a little bit different than I do. And the thing is, I think if we feel like we're in control and if we are following certain rules and we expect, we expect others, we're going to be more likely to judge others because they're not doing what we think they should do. And for those who are not Jewish, and in light of how the Jewish leaders went after Jesus, it might be easy for us to take the side of the Gentiles in all of this and consider that it was the Jews that were boasting. But it's important to remember that not all Jewish Christians were boastful about their faith. And really, following the law, it, it may not have been a boastful pride thing for them. It was their identity. It was their culture. It's what they had grown up with and something that they probably loved for many of them. It may not have just been a mindless ritual for them. It was something that meant a lot to them. And so now they're getting kind of scared and maybe even a little sad thinking, so now that I become a Christian, are you saying that that wipes out the law? That's like everything that I hold dear. It's everything that I've known. And, and Paul is saying that's not the case. And so I, I mentioned earlier that even if you haven't been, if you're not Jewish and you weren't raised in that, you might think, well, we don't really have those kinds of things, but we do. Even at Seacoast, you might notice we kind of have our certain rituals. We have our certain ways of, of doing things. And I also think back, um, I, I grew up in a Christian home, specifically in a Southern Baptist denomination. So for the first um, 12 years of my life, we went to one Baptist church in Monrovia, California. And then uh, later when I was, I think 11 or 12, we switched to a church in Glendora where I grew up. Both were Southern Baptist. And especially in, in the first one, uh, the older one, back in the you know, 70s, something when I was a kid, you know, we, we had certain rituals. And there are things that I kind of forgot about until I was reading through the study and, and preparing for it. And we always had, well, first of all, we always had hymn books. And the hymn books were in the back of the pews. So there was like a wooden, uh, you know, holder built into the back of the pews where you had your Baptist hymnal. And so we would have the certain numbers of hymns. And so we always started out with um, the opening, the opening hymn or prayer, the, the uh, invocation, which was invoking or inviting uh, God and the Holy Spirit in, into, the, into our presence. And then we had a music leader. So it wasn't like a worship team like we have at Seacoast now. It was, sometimes we had a choir, sometimes not, but we always had one music leader and he'd stand up behind the pulpit with the hymn book there on the pulpit and he would conduct us and lead in the hymns. And hymns typically had four verses, sometimes more. And our, another ritual that I remember is that we always sang verses one, two, and four. I don't really know what was wrong with verse three on any song. We never, we never did verse three. I don't know. I don't know. Weird ritual. Don't even know why. We just one, two, and four. We did it. And then we would have our uh, special music, usually a, it'd be a piano solo or a, a vocalist and in a sermon. And then you, you'd have an invitation after that, which is where the pastor invited anyone to come down who wanted to accept Jesus for the first time. And we would usually sing a hymn over that. Um, one of the go-tos was a song called Just As I Am. That one was a biggie. If you were raised in that type of uh, environment, you might be familiar with that song. And then we would end with a benediction. 
another song, uh, kind of kind of like our walkout uh, in today's world in Seacoast. So we still had our our rituals, and there's something kind of neat about that. I think to me there was there was a certain comfort in knowing what was going to happen, and I love that I was raised in that. Not to say that I necessarily want to go back to that exact same thing, but I think at that time, if somebody had said, oh, you know what, all that stuff you did, no, you don't need to do it anymore. That's kind of stupid. You know, you don't need it. That might have been a little difficult for me and for my family at that time because it's what we knew and it's what we loved. So I need to remember if, if I get a tendency to want to look down on somebody else because, oh, they're still bound by those rules. I need to remember I've got my rules too and my rituals that I might stick with and I, I need to examine that. So now we move into chapter four. And in this chapter, Paul goes back to Abraham in Genesis. And you may or may not know, but Abraham is considered to be the father of the, the Jewish faith. And Paul is telling them that even though Abraham, that even Abraham, I should say, was justified in faith and this was before Christ, so he didn't have Christ's sacrifice. He reminds them that in Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And this happened before he was circumcised. That is a big deal because one of the points where there was contention between Jews and Gentiles was around circumcision, where Jews were saying, no, nope, you need to get circumcised. And Gentiles were saying, mm -mm, no, we don't, we're not Jews. And so that was a big deal. So Paul is telling them, hey, Abraham was considered righteous before he was circumcised. And so if, if he could be justified by that, then the Jews shouldn't expect the Gentiles to follow their law. Paul's telling them, hey, if his faith was enough for him before circumcision, it should also be enough for the, the Gentiles. And he's trying to unite these believers, and he's trying to stop some of the, the arguments that are, that are happening and, and trying to divide them. And so when it comes, and he's telling them, hey, when it comes to the body of Christ, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. There should be no distinction between ethnicity or culture if we're all part of the body of Christ. That doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything but it shouldn't divide us, whatever disagreement we may have. And he goes on to tell them that Abraham had faith in the face of impossible circumstances. God promised him that he would be the father of many nations. And when he got that promise, Abraham was about 100 years old, him and his wife, Sarah. So there was no reasonable expectation from a human perspective that that could happen. And yet, Abraham's faith did not waver. He still trusted God. And so that brings us to our next application point, which is there are times when there is nothing we can do but trust God. I think of a time I, I went, when I was looking over this, obviously our, our, our current time maybe, but I even thought of there have been so many times when God has proven himself trustworthy. And in particular, I had a, a season in my life where I think God was really trying to show me that I didn't trust him as much as I thought I did. And the way it, it came out was um, about a year ago, and for about a year, so from about fall of 2018 to fall of 2019, I stepped in as a director of our Seal Beach campus. So Seacoast Grace, if you didn't know, has a wonderful uh, campus, a church down in Seal Beach, uh, right off Main Street, it's on 10th and Electric. And an amazing group of people down there, they have their own, uh, they have worship down there on a smaller scale, and then they get the sermon via video. And so I was very familiar with that venue. In fact, that's where I started with Seacoast back in 92 with uh, Doyle and Connie. And I had also been down there periodically to lead worship. And so I was familiar with it, but taking on the role of director was a whole new world for me and, and kind of beyond, way beyond my comfort level. And it's a time when I think God really stretched me and I, I thought of one particular circumstance where I realized that I was not trusting God as, as much as I should. And he proved himself trustworthy. And it, it may seem like kind of, especially compared to what we're all dealing with now, it kind of, kind of stupid, but kind of not. So I was coming in right 
you know, the Christmas season, holiday season was starting. So that's always a big deal. And one of the deals is that the, the church, we, you know, we decorate the church. Now, obviously, main campus gets decorated and Seal Beach also gets decorated. And they have quite a, quite a lot. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm responsible for that. I need to make sure it gets decorated. And I, I know, I mean, I decorate my house, but, you know, I have a small house and it's not that big a deal. And I just felt this weight of responsibility. And so in the couple weekends leading up to that day, and we'd usually decorate the Sunday after Thanksgiving and anybody that was available, we would ask them, Hey, if you're available that Sunday, just hang out after church and we'll, we're going to decorate. We've got Christmas trees. We've got lights. We got a bunch of stuff to, to put out. And so I had made that announcement and two or three people got back to me and, and actually made a point of saying, Hey, Deb will be there. And I remember that Sunday morning waking up at like three 30, and just, oh, what if nobody, what if nobody shows up? How am I going to get, how am I going to get these like seven foot trees down from the attic and put them up myself? And how am I going to get them all decorated? And how am I going to get the lights up? And how am I going to get all these things and this other, and all the garland and all of that? I, I started feeling overwhelmed thinking, oh God. And I remember praying, please God, please let more than two people show up to help with this. Cause I don't, I think this is way over my head. And so after church that day, I think about 12 to 15 people stayed after and, and a good mix of men and women and even some kids. And it was amazing. The guys went up to the attic. They pulled the stuff down. There were some women that have a much better decorating eye than I do. And they were great at delegating. Hey, you put this over there. Hey, you put that over there. And they took over and I loved it. All I had to do was order pizza on my phone. And I remember looking up and thinking an hour and a half had gone by and they had it done. And I remember just thinking, oh, thank you, God. But I also remember thinking, you were worried for nothing. Shocking, right? I, I had put all this on myself, like I had to do it. And, and God was saying, you know what? He, he's got it. He's going to raise up the right people. And it got done. In fact, in that year, there were a lot of other little things kind of like that where I would find myself getting anxious. Even, and you think I would learn, and I think I finally started to, but every single one of those things God took care of. He raised up the people down there, and we got it done, and it turned out to be just a, a great year down there. So there are times when we have to do something. There are also times when we need to step back, and sometimes we might be tempted to take matters into our own hands and try to make something happen instead of waiting for God to come through. And it can feel frustrating because God's not always going to tell us when a certain promise is going to happen. Like Abraham and Sarah, they had this promise. They didn't know when it was going to happen and they had to wait and, and trust him. So we need to remember that he is in control. And, and if, if he's told us something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Just may not be on our timeline. This moves us into chapter five of Romans. And this chapter moves into a theme of peace and joy and hope. And Paul once again emphasizes that it's faith that justifies us and nothing we've done. And he reminds us of the hope that we have because of this. So who would you be willing to die for? Probably if you're, if you're a parent, um, you're, you're probably thinking, oh, my kids. Yeah, maybe, maybe your spouse. Oh, I don't know. I'm not married. So maybe, hopefully. You lay down your life for your spouse, maybe some good friends, maybe for a really good person. But if somebody asks you to lay down your life for a bad person, you probably, a perfect stranger, even good or bad, I'd probably think, oh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think I would. I don't think I would. And yet Christ did that for all of us. He laid down his life for all of us, for all time, knowing who we were, what we have done, what we would do. In the future, he died knowing that. And he died when we were still powerless. There's nothing that we could have done to earn that. And if he was willing to lay down his life for us before we did anything good or worthy, why would we think that there's anything we can do to earn that? We can't. It's like uh, being convicted of something that we did and having a sentence that's just and somebody else saying, you know what? I'm going to take over that jail sentence for you. I'm just going to do it. I don't even know you. You might have really done it. And you might deserve that sentence, but I'm going to take it over for you. That's what he did. I recently um, read a commentary, and this kind of ties in with verse 12, and, and I'll talk about the commentary in a moment. In verse 12 of chapter 5, 
and I'll pull it up here. Paul talks about how sin entered the world through one man, and that one man was Adam. And it starts out, therefore, just as sin entered the world through that one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. And then he goes on to talk about um, the gift of, of Jesus. So basically, Adam was the beginning of the sin. Jesus was kind of the end of it. Not, not the total end, because obviously sin's still happening, but he, he brought a, a way out of it. And the commentary that I recently read was by two guys named Colin S. Smith and Tim Augustine. And they said, human beings are not like pebbles on a beach. We're like leaves on a tree. And if the root of the tree is diseased, then the disease will spread to every part of the tree. And so it's kind of like sin started at the root of the tree with Adam. And we are leaves on that tree. And so we are also prone to sin no matter how good. We, and we live in a fallen world. This is less than what God intended. But the good news is that God is still in control and his grace is still available to us. And that brings us to our last application point here, which is we might feel powerless in the world we live in, but God's power is still available to us when we trust him. And, you know, it's funny, we had planned this Bible study months and months ago. We knew, generally speaking, that around this time we'd be covering Romans long before any of this crazy virus stuff started. And as I was reading these chapters, I thought, oh my gosh, how, how appropriate is it that we're studying this right now, even though we didn't plan it? Because God knew. God knew back when, when Gwen and Autumn and I were, were sitting down, we were talking about all this, that this is when we would all be going through this lesson. And I, I, I have to confess, y'all, that I'm, I'm kind of sick of hearing about the virus. And I don't mean to make light of it. I don't mean that I, I know it's awful and I know it's serious. But after a while, you just start feeling overwhelmed. I usually like the local morning news. That's kind of a part of my ritual. And generally, I, I work from home most days even before this started. So my work routine hasn't really changed. And usually as I'm getting ready for work or maybe as I'm getting set up in the morning, if I don't have any meetings, I'll have a TV on and just have the news going. And since this started, I found that I don't even, I, I mean, I used to like to listen to the weather or the traffic and maybe the traffic because it kind of made me feel good that I'm here in my house. <laughs> I don't have to be out in the traffic, but I, I just don't even want to hear it anymore because I feel like every other minute is the virus and it gets to a point where outside of doing the certain things that I know we should do, staying home, wearing a mask when I go out, washing my hands um, often, aside from that, I, I just feel like completely powerless. I have no control. We don't know when this is going to end. And so and I even thought the other day, I haven't even looked at my, my retirement plan at work, my 401k, because as this was starting, I looked at it and it was already looking a little scary. And I thought, you know what? I'm not even going to look at it for another couple months because there's no point. There's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands at this point. And I think that if I didn't trust God, going through this right now might put me into a tailspin. And maybe that's where you're at right now. Maybe you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't even know. I'm just, I'm freaking out right now. I think a lot of people are, and, and I can understand that. And I'm hoping that connecting with uh, these groups is helping, but know that God is still in control. I know a lot of us have been saying that. Doyle's been saying it. Cody's been saying it. It's because it's true. And I think we need to, to cling to that now more than ever, because underneath all of these unknowns in the world right now, there's one thing that I do know, that if God could have power over sin and death, there's nothing that is beyond his control. Nothing, not even this. And that doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect here on earth. It's not. In fact, we know it's not going to be perfect on this side of heaven, but we can count on the hope that we have in him and we can count on that eternity that we are going to, going to have with him on that hope. So I hope that in the, in the interest of hope, I hope that you have a great discussion with uh, your table ladies. And I feel like we're still all kind of meeting around a table. Just now it's our dining room table or coffee table or 
whatever table you might have. I hope you have a great time talking through the discussion questions. I hope you're connecting. I hope you're praying for each other through the week because I think that's also going to be what gets us through. So I hope you all have a wonderful week and can't wait to see you all back live and in person.